Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> I heard about a guy, he was praying, and he prayed, Lord, it's been a great day so far. I haven't had any bad thoughts. I haven't said anything ugly. I haven't bragged. I haven't looked at a woman. I haven't done anything bad, and it's just been a great day. He said, but now the challenge begins. I've got to get out of bed, get ready, and go to work. <laughs> Life is a challenge, isn't it? Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at a series of feasts, and uh, next week we'll begin that study. But today we're looking at the Passover, the final of the ten plagues of Egypt. The word Exodus means a way out, a way out. And certainly this was a way out of bondage. The Passover was a way out of bondage for the children of Israel. And our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus, has provided us a way out of the bondage of sin. And if you don't know him today and you're bound by sin, you can have that liberty, he promises in Galatians. I love Romans 6. I heard a great, great speaker from Columbia Bible College, uh, Brother Frank Sells, say, God's liberty bell is not cracked. We're free in Christ and free from the bondage of sin. There are four spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. And we plan to look at all of those. Pentecost we'll look, on May, look at on May 28, which is 50 days after Passover. And we'll uh, look at the four spring feasts. The, the fall feasts are tied to agriculture. We're not going to look at those at this time. But we are going to look at the spring feast. And today we're looking at the Lord's Passover, as Exodus chapter 12 calls it. And we're going to read the text in a moment. I will try to time this perfectly to preach on the Feast of First Fruits on Easter Sunday, and then time it where we talk about, as I said, the Feast of Pentecost later. But in between, we're going to transition from uh, the Old Testament to the New. We're going to finish the plagues, the feast, and transition into the book of Acts and go through Acts. Now, that's a long study. Acts is a lot, will take us a long time, but I will once in a while take a break from Acts and do an epistle or a gospel. I know on Wednesdays we've been looking at the gospels because we went through the parables in chronological order. Now we're going through the miracles. So we've been on the New Testament a lot on Wednesdays in the gospels, but we'll deviate from Acts once in a while. But that's going to be the next book the Lord's laid on my heart for us to go through, and that will take some time. I love the progression in Scripture. You know, scholars tell us the Old Testament introduces a subject and the New Testament completes the idea of the thought process. Re redemption's introduced in, in Genesis and obviously fulfilled in the New Testament in so many progressions. And here we have a progression of the offertory system. Remember, the first sacrifice was for individuals. Adam and Eve had sinned. And the Bible said the Lord clothed them in skins, animal skins. So he taught them the idea of atonement, didn't he? Their sin had to be atoned for. And then we find in Exodus 12, the whole family. And uh, if you have a lamb and you can't eat the lamb, invite your neighbors and extended family. And then in Leviticus, we find the offering is for the entire nation. And then in the New Testament, the lamb once for all was slain for the whole world. Amen. So the progression, we'll look at some more of that in a moment. But stand with me, and we're going to read simply Exodus chapter, uh, chapter 12 and verse 11. And we will read verse 12 as well at this time. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I love 1 Corinthians 5, 7, which is on the screen, which says, For even Christ... Our Passover is sacrificed for us. It's the Lord's Passover. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. Judgment, I am the Lord. I love that. He's our Lord, and he's going he's gonna, to... Uh, uh, do all this for the children of Israel, and then he'll do it all for us, or did it all for us in Calvary. Let's pray. God bless us. As we take a look in the book for a walk in the world, that, Lord, we'll glean something. We'll get some of those handfuls on purpose, and you've given us a lot more than a small handful. You've given us an abundance of wealth from this great book. Forty men of God, inspired and errant and fallible, who wrote 
and gave us 66 books. We thank you for that. Bless today as we take a look in this book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Going at several things today, uh, preachers use outlines a lot of times, and I used to challenge my students uh, to get a contextual outline, don't jump all over the place, and sometimes we are limited to three, and, and yet we don't find very many three-point outlines in the Bible. We find some outlines, but many times we find Jesus and, and the apostles preaching, and there's not an outline at all, and sometimes you have the nine woes or the, the ninefold fruit and so forth, but I have three today. I always have an outline, don't always really... Uh, you know, stress it. But today we're going to look at an appointment with death, an animal without spot, and an application of blood. And we begin our study in chapter 11, verse 5, and then we'll be in chapter 12. It says in 11, 5, And all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beast. And of course, chapter 12, verse 12, we already read. He said, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt and I will smite all the firstborn. I know the, we know clearly scripture teaches the wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans 6.23 tells us that. And we know we all have an appointment with death. As Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto men once to die. And uh, Jews had some misconceptions because they were considered the chosen people. They knew they were. They were given the oracles of God. But sometimes they thought that because they were children of Abraham physically, that that gave them the right to access heaven and they were automatically right with God. And of course, Jesus is going to make it clear that that did not save them. And so he'll, he'll deal with that when he comes. Um, but we know that we are children of Abraham by faith. Did you know that? Now you say, well, I'm not a Jew, but you're a child of Abraham by faith, the New Testament tells us. Yeah. So we are thankful to be a child of God, a child of Abraham. But Jews somehow believed they had a special place. And of course, the concept of firstborn in the Old Testament is really, uh, a, really a, a rich teaching. And the firstborn child got a double inheritance. And the firstborn really had priority in the family. They were in charge of the family after dad passed. They would rule everything. And so here, Jesus uh, is, is, of course, or not Jesus, but I mean back in the Old Testament, the firstborn concept, he's going to deal with the children of Egypt, all the firstborn. I love Numbers 3.12. It's on the screen. And I, behold, have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that open up the womb, the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So what God did after the children of Israel were established by law, he took rather than the firstborn of every family and consecrate them to service, he took an entire tribe, the Levites. And they took care of the house of God. They were the servants, the porters. They did everything, the sacrificial system. He took a whole tribe instead of the firstborn. But here in Egypt, the firstborn are going to die. In verse 2 of chapter 12, it says here, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. Now, the Jewish calendar was a lunar calendar based on the moon, a lunar calendar. And that's how everything was, was decided. The late March, April, uh, late March, early April was the time uh, of the Passover. They called the month Abid, and then in, until ba Babylonian captivity, I'm going too fast. And then after that, they began to call it Nisan, according to Nehemiah and Esther. So their calendar was different, and that's why oftentimes our Easter time is different than the Passover time, because of the difference in calendars. But uh, Easter is often celebrated differently. In verse 3, I like this, it says here, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month, or the tenth day of this month, they shall take them, every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. So on the tenth of the month, they would set aside a lamb. Now the tenth of the month was a Sunday. It was a Sunday. And the seventeenth, resurrection day, would also be a Sunday, wouldn't it? And so they would set aside a lamb. This year we're doing things a little different. We're not going to have a Palm Sunday. But you realize when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was the lamb that was being set aside to die for the sins of the world. And so Palm Sunday is very significant. And we'll talk about that probably next week. How if you look at a calendar, the Jewish calendar, and you, you'll, you'll, you'll study that. And from the decree of Cyrus, you'll find that Jesus rode in the very day he was supposed to ride in. 
It just lines up perfectly. And he was set aside. While the Hallam is the king of the Jews, he'd be rejected and crucified uh, on the, on the, uh, you know, a few days later. Now, notice here again, verse 4. So verse 3, he's set aside. Verse 4, and, and if the family is small and you have this lamb, then you go ahead and invite your neighbors, it says here. We won't read it. Invite your neighbors, and the extended family could come. They wanted them to eat the meat and to devour the meat and, and, and enjoy it. And, of course, the Passover today reminds them of something way back in Egypt. But it should also remind them of Calvary. But the Jews don't accept the Lord Jesus. And so he says here, uh, partake of this, eat this lamb. And, of course, we remind ourselves when we take the Lord's Supper. When we take that little piece of bread, and we will do that the week of the Passion Week, and we take that little piece of bread, we're reminded of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we take that little bit of grape juice, we're reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so here, he is saying here, you know, invite the neighbors and so forth, and eat that lamb. And so we have this appointment with death. And you do know that every one of you has an appointment with death. I don't know about tomorrow. He holds tomorrow. If he called me home, I'm ready to go. Are you ready? Do you know the Lord? If not, boy, I'd meet him today. But we have here an appointment with death. And then in verse 5 of chapter 12, we have here an animal without spot. It says here, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goat. So here you take this little animal, a perfect specimen. They weren't to take one with a broken leg or a blemish or some sort of skin disease. They took the best lamb they could find without blemish. And what does 1 Peter say on the screen? But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus Christ never sinned. Never sinned. He was a perfect lamb. That's the only way he could pay for my sin was to be a perfect sacrifice. And the difference is in the Old Testament, that lamb just atoned for a year. It covered for a year. That Hebrew word is translated pitch. And a lot of scholars point out that the ark was a type of the Lord bearing the wrath of God, covered in pitch. And, and, and the atonement for, our, for the sins of Egypt or Israel was just temporary. It was a, a temporary covering. The New Testament word is propitiation. He died once and he paid for my sin day. It's as far as the east is from the west. Love the song this morning. Do you know Romans 8 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not a star. You, if you take the star at its greatest zenith and then the star at its lowest point, the word bathos is the Greek word, that is it, that your sin is further away than that. Think of that. All because of what he did at Calvary. He propitiated our sin. And so here now we have an animal without spot. And again we see a progression. I love this in, in the chapter. Look at verse 3, the last line. And uh, I love this. Just a simple thing. A lamb for a house. A lamb. I love the angel said, a lamb, Luke 2, 11. Then you notice verse 4, and it says to the household, be too little for the lamb. Notice now with the definite article, the lamb. The Samaritan said he's, he's the Savior. And then finally in verse 5, your lamb. And love what Mary said. Here's Mary who some believe was sinless. No, she wasn't because she said, said he's my Savior. A little progression there. And we see that in the New Testament as well. And then I love if you take uh, Genesis 22, 7. Isaac said, where's the lamb? And of course, Abraham's, you know, going to think, think he's going to have to kill his son. And I believe he was totally willing to. But Abraham said, God will provide. And that word provide is a Latin word. means to look ahead. So way back with Abraham and Isaac, it was a type of Calvary, wasn't it? He said, God will provide, and surely he did on Mount Calvary. He provided a lamb. But he said, where's the lamb? John the Baptist saw Jesus on the beach and said, look, there's the lamb. Behold the lamb. And then I love Revelation 5, 12, because the angels say, worthy is the lamb. Isn't that something? Worthy is the lamb. Say that. Worthy is the lamb. Jesus Christ never sinned. He was God in the flesh. 
the incarnation, the Son of God, yet God in the flesh, who never, ever, ever sinned. I heard a preacher this week, uh, it's, he, he calls this program the Potter's Touch. And he says he doesn't believe in the Trinity. He can't explain it or understand it, so he doesn't believe it. T.D. Jakes. And I believe he's a saved man by what I hear from him. But, you know, the Trinity's tough to accept, but we accept it by faith. faith. I don't understand how God has always existed, how he spoke this world into existence. But we take these doctrines by faith. And, and so I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Trinity, the Savior of the world, and I know he's sinless because my Bible tells me so. So he's a worthy lamb. And the angels saying, worthy is the lamb. And I say that this morning, worthy is the lamb. Now we get down to verse 6. And he says, you shall keep it, this lamb they set aside on that Sunday, until the 14th day of the month. And that's a Thursday. And ye shall then in the 14th day of the month, he says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, now think of this. A lot of things to think about here. I remember as a young Bible college student, people arguing over which day Jesus was crucified. And let me just say this to you. I'll give you some ideas and I'll give you my opinion. But you know, I know he was crucified and that's really all that matters. <laughs> And I remember guys would say, well, it couldn't be Friday because you needed three days and three nights and, and that just gives you two nights at the most. And some would say, it's got to be Wednesday because you need three complete days and three complete nights. And I didn't agree with that. And so back and forth, we would argue. I, and here, it's interesting to me, the lamb is killed on a Thursday. And that would give you three days and three nights. So I like the Thursday idea. But folks, we could argue things like that and we can cause things like that to divide us. I just know this. He died. He died for me. And he rose again on the 17th of the month. The ark rested on the 17th day of the month. And he died and rose again on the 17th day of the month. That's what we hold to that Resurrection Sunday. And every Sunday Spurgeon said is Resurrection Sunday. So I thank God he died. So here on the 14th day, on a Thursday, they kill the lamb. And notice here, it's interesting because it says here that when they kill the lamb, that the assembly, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Isn't that interesting? Everybody's involved in this. A.W. Pink, he's an interesting writer, writes a lot, a lot of types and interesting things. He says that's a type of the fact that all of us put Jesus on the cross. It was your sin and my sin. All of us were involved in crucifying our Lord. Don't just blame it on the Roman soldiers or, or, or the, the high priest. We all sinned and he died for the sins, John said, of the whole world. He died for that sinner who's broken and under a bridge begging for money. He died for the drug addict. And he also died for the hypocrite that stands in the pulpit and preaches even though he doesn't know Jesus. He yeah. died for every sinner. For the sins of the whole world. And so here we know the whole congregation was involved. Notice in verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. Now we're going to jump over to the second half of chapter 12. But here we find now an application of blood. <coughs> An application of blood. I love Hebrews 9, 22. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But something you want to point out. Little details like this do matter. It says here in verse uh, uh, 22 now we'll look at. And it says here, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel, that's the head post, and the two side posts with the blood that's in the basin. And that's interesting. Now, notice that word strike. It's also translated stricken. And we go now together. It's not on the screen. I want you to look this one up. Isaiah 53, 4. Some of you know where I'm going. You're smart people. But we want to see this. I want you to mark your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4. Now, it's interesting because uh, rabbis say, well, Isaiah 53 is written about Israel. And uh, all through the Old Testament, Israel is referred to in the feminine as 
the bride. It's always referred to as she or her. And, and here, where it says he was wounded and he was bruised, they say this is also Israel. And of course, it's easy to frustrate them when you point out that this was not Israel. But this is talking about Jesus, Isaiah 53. It's a prophecy about Jesus. And we know this is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. He's despised and rejected, verse 3 says. And it goes on to say, He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And that, look what it says. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Same word. You see the hyssop, they didn't just gently, you know, paint the side post and the head post to the doorway. They smote the head post. His head had a crown of thorns and he's our head. Did you know that? He's the head of the church. And they smote the side post on either side. What does Jesus say to us? He uses a metaphor. He says, I am the door. Yeah. Way back then he gave a clear picture God gave a clear picture of Jesus in the doorway. Jesus is in nails driven through his hand as they smote the side post. It's certainly a type pointing ahead to the, the, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. Here's the Lord Jesus, I am the door. Amen. They were to stay in their house and weren't to trodden over the blood and stay there and wait till God's finished work. And the death angel would pass over and if he saw the blood, he would pass over. You know, Jesus is an advocate for us. He says to the Father that the blood's been applied. I love that. And the great judge, he turns all judgment eventually over to the Son. I, I even like the, the thing about the Holy Spirit being our legal advocate. That's one of the words that describes the Holy Spirit. The Trinity all working for us. The Father on the throne and Jesus by his right side who died and shed his blood to pardon me. To forgive and take away my sin. And so here, what a type it is here of Jesus Christ being sacrificed for the sin of the world. As they struck that post on either side and on the head. What a type of Jesus Christ. Then we notice back in chapter, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, it says here, 12, 11, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet. They're supposed to eat it. They're going to take a journey. God wanted them ready. Are you ready? I, I wish I could take a journey today. In one one hundredth of a second, the twinkling of an eye, take a journey and meet him in the air. I, I mean, wouldn't that be something? I mean, if you are left behind the building, you can have it. Wonderful building, but I won't need this place anymore. I'll be with him. Amen. You can have my home and my assets. I'll be with him. Amen. We're going to leave it all behind. But I, I would love to take that journey. Here they had to be ready to go. Are you ready to go? But notice here, it says here that you have, be ready, be ready, and you eat it. Why would they eat the meat? Well, for several reasons. It's a type of the body of Christ. But also, they're going to take a journey. And they need strength for this journey. There's always a practical aspect here. They would consume this meat for strength. I love Hebrews 5, 14, which says, Strong meat belongs to the mature Christian. I'm paraphrasing that. Strong meat belongs to the mature Christian. When, you're, when you first become a Christian, you, you get the milk and the milk and the milk. And, and that's so good and so important for the new Christian. But you know, sometimes we can be saved for a while and not be ready for the meat because we haven't grown. We're, we're not listening. We're not applying scripture to our life. We're not in the word. And we're not ready for the meat. It belongs to the mature Christian. As you grow and mature in Christ, you become hungry for the meat. You love the meat. You love the more, more in-depth things in Scripture. You know that you need them for strength. And if you're still stuck on the milk, you need to grow in Jesus. Faith goes by hearing and hearing by the Word. You need to get in your Bible and grow and be ready for the meat of the Word. So here, they consume the meat for strength. Then in verse 12, they received assurance here. Notice this. For I will pass through the land of Egypt. And you could add the word I, but we'll smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. I love that. What an assurance. You know, he says to us, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. When you're a young Christian, you begin to doubt. You start to think, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I sinned today. Well, you learn quickly that you're going to sin all the time. 
You're going to sin every day. And you thank God for 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He restores that fellowship. You don't have to get saved again and trodden over the blood again. You're saved. He puts that catheter in. All the yuck comes out. He cleanses us. And so thank God for the opportunity to make it right. But boy, you're doubting your salvation. You're a new Christian. And sin's making you think, I thought when I got saved, I'd never sin again. Well, that's, that's a lie of the devil. <laughs> There's so many lies. Uh, yeah, people who say, well, if you're saved, you should never be sick. If you're sick, it's of the devil. Well, that's not true at all. And you can be sick just because you're sick. And, uh, you know, that's not, that doesn't mean the devil has control of you. And some teach that if, if you get saved, you'll be rich. And one guy says, I'll make you a millionaire. Send all your money to me. He, he says it's quite regular. He said, I made a lot of millionaires. He didn't make any millionaires. If God gives you a million dollars and trusts you with that, great. But he didn't help anybody become a millionaire. But that prosperity stuff. Hey, sometimes life is tough. You'll be sick and you will sin and you'll get discouraged and sometimes you want to give up. But don't be weary in well-doing. For if, if, if we continue to do the right thing, we'll reap in due season, in God's season. But those of you that doubt your experience, you need to get in the Bible more. Read the Bible. Get into the preaching. You know what I do? You know what I do each week? You wouldn't believe this? Well, I guess you'd believe it. I've probably told you. <laughs> I make sure to listen to quite a few preachers during the week. I love Chuck Swindoll. He's so practical to me. So I listen to Chuck Swindoll. I listen to David Jeremiah. This morning I listened to, to uh, uh, the Egyptian guy. Oh, I'm brain dead right now. Michael Youssef. Then afterward, David Jeremiah came out and I listened to a little of him. Why, why do I do that? Because I need it. Amen. You think I'm above sin? I told you the only way to live above sin is rent a room above a, above a bar. I need it. So I mark my Bibles and I listen to these guys. Sometimes it's just simple things that I already, I already know, but I'm reminded of simple truths. And then yesterday at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was listening to Warren Wearsby, a dear friend of, of our entire home church. And I love to hear the word. I need the word. I study all those hours and I need to hear it preached. That's why I do that. So that's why I tell you, you need the word. You need to get your word. Harold always pushes the devotion books, our daily bread. He pushes them all the time from the pulpit. If, if, you, if you don't understand scripture, start with a little booklet like that. It's so great to explain a little thing, truth to you, a little verse to you. But the word of God sustains us. And you need the word. And you need to grow in the word. And the word becomes a part of our life. And so he says here, we, they received assurance from God. And I said that. Verse, then the third thing, they, they disallowed the uncircumcised to partake. It's interesting in verses 43 to 48, we don't have time. But they would not let the outsider partake in this if they weren't circumcised. Now circumcision was only a, a, a picture, a type of being part of the covenant of God, like baptism is a type of our salvation, a few slight differences. But the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one with another. If you don't walk in light, your fellowship with God and mankind is broken. If you live a life of sin, you can't have fellowship unless you're walking in the light. And so a lot of times we think, boy, you know, we can live how we want to. You won't have good fellowship. You know, I know immediately when I'm out of fellowship with God, I have an anxiety that comes into my heart. And I say, sometimes I do this, Lord, I know I've done something or I wouldn't feel this way. What is it? And that sweet Holy Spirit will just bring something to my mind I've done that's stupid or harmful or not considerate of someone. And uh, so I'll back off that guy's bumper. I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> But he does that, doesn't he? He speaks to us and says, no, that, that's not the way to go. And then you can get that peace by saying, I'm sorry, Lord. I agree with you. I confess it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I love this, all this was just foolishness to the Egyptians. Listen to this. Their lamb god was Ammon, king of the gods and source of light. The Nisan, according to their Egyptian calendar, was the chief month, and the full moon was at this time, which meant the peak of Ammon's powers, A-M-O-N. Thus, the Egyptians were not allowed to even touch lambs. Here are all these Jews <laughs> taking a lamb 
and killing a lamb and each house is celebrating a Passover. And they're not sure, even the Jews aren't sure what they're doing, but they're doing what they're told to do. Take this blood and strike this head post and strike the side post. And blood's going to be everywhere and you just wait there on God. And they don't really understand fully what's going on, but they're obeying Moses and God. To the Egyptians, it's all foolishness. But what does 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 23 say? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It goes on to say in, in verse 22, and it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. It's a stumbling block. And unto the, the Greeks or Gentiles, same thing. It's foolishness. You know what we do is foolishness to the world, isn't it? And we celebrate the death of Jesus Christ. And we fully believe he rose again. That's foolishness to the world. Everything we do is foolishness to the world. They just look at us, and I, I, as I said so many times before, they, they think, what's wrong with those people? They say they're fanatics. They believe weird things, and yet we're in Christ, and we see it clearly. And, and they're all worked up about things. I'm always amazed at how the world's all worked up about issues. Global warming. Oh, global warming. Oh. Oh, if we don't stop driving gas in eight years, it's all going to end, one senator or congresswoman said. And now our president came out, and I'm not picking on him, but he said, we're going to need fossil fuels for at least 10 years. Well, he needs to talk to her and tell her it's going to be okay for 10 more years. <laughs> it's mass hysteria. People are on hunger strike over it. Is global warming real? According to the book of Revelation, it is real. It's part of the tribulation period. But I'm not worried about it. Because I'm gone. Darkness is real. We talked about that last week. We already see spirits of darkness. It's going to be literal in the tribulation. So the world's all worked up. And they think, why aren't we worked up? Why aren't we all upset? Why aren't we upset that people can't express themselves? And it's just getting mind-boggling. But when we're in Christ, we're in a special, unique family. We're part of the kingdom of God. I love that. And one day it's going to be a literal kingdom. Jesus is going to set foot on this earth and set up a thousand year reign. I love that. Look at verse 23. It says here in 12:23, it says, For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And of course, it goes on to say that he'll stop the destroyer from smiting those who have the blood on the side post and head post. But the Lord is going to deal with them. You know, he appoints his death angel. And all those Egyptians lost their firstborn. And yet, what does the Bible say is the reason for Jesus coming? The thief comes to kill and destroy. But Jesus comes to give us life and give us life more abundantly. I love John 10, 10. I love what he says in Luke twenty two fifteen. 15. Said, he said, as he's talked to his disciples, with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. You know what I love about God? I love that God wants me. If you're lost today, he wants to save you. He wants to fellowship with me. You know the verse, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. That's not a salvation verse, actually. It's all about fellowship. You know what God wants from each of you? Fellowship. He wants fellowship. He wants you in the word and in prayer. And he wants you listening to him. He loves that. He wants to celebrate this Passover with you. We're coming up on Easter and God wants to spend quality time with each one of us. Isn't that something? He cares about me that much. Sometimes I can't even be with myself. And yet God wants to spend time with me. That Brother Wiersbe said one time, I got neighbors that I can't get along with and God wants to spend time with me. That's our God. A God that loves us and cares. And folks, if he sees the blood applied to your life, you're going to live eternally. And he sees it because he shed it. And, and, and God entrusts Jesus Christ for our soul. I love that. I had a friend used to always say, thank God for Jesus. First time he said, I said, what, what's that? Thank God for Jesus. Yeah, thank God that he gave his son Jesus. I get it. Do you thank God for Jesus today? 
He's the lamb who shed his blood one time for your sins. And he wants to save you. And if you're here today and you're not a believer, today would be a great day to be saved. You understand. And the Holy Spirit has taught you this morning because he always does a perfect job. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for <clears throat> what I've said, even though I'm not the greatest orator <laughs> by, by any means and, and a long way off. But God, you speak through your word and you speak well. We thank you for the type here. The type way back to the children of Israel that you gave them a great word picture. They could understand enough to follow Moses and be delivered from the bondage of slavery. And Lord, you made yourself very plain to them when you sent your son on the earth, Jesus, for 33 and a half years. And those followers of Jesus believed and followed your son, believing he is indeed the Messiah. And they were right because you did die for the sins of the world. And one day you're going to come again and receive us to yourself. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for our salvation. I ask you to speak to hearts. I don't know the hearts here, God, but if there's anybody here with anything, they need to come and pray that they will uh, for any reason, as we certainly want people to respond. Bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated.